Welcome to Deep Tech 315. Our first topic today is Micron. They reported their earnings. They came in line with the May quarter and are slightly beat for the May quarter, and they had guided August quarter in line with expectations. Shares traded off 7% on the, the news. This, of course, is an important company because they make this memory and getting more into this high bandwidth memory that pairs up really nice with some NVIDIA products and they are riding the wave of AI. Their business in the May quarter was up 82%, and the guidance was for 90% year-over-year growth for the August quarter. And so when you put those kind of uh, forces together, it looks like uh, things generally were in the right spot, but it just wasn't enough to meet what the, the hype was around the quarter. How, what do you explain that 7% decline? It was actually better than I expected in terms of the decline. Coming into the quarter, my sense was there was a lot that had been priced into the stock. It's had a great run this year, and it's had an even stronger run the last month or two. And so I think there's probably a lot of fast money, and I think there's a lot of fast money in general chasing some of these AI hardware names. So to me, it wasn't a surprise. Base case should have been, hey, this thing might sell off a little bit here unless they just have some well, the, astronomical But the base case with AI, like. I agree. So I think that, the bottom line you know, is if you're stock not up, just uh, looking to make it, a trade uh, for a week or two or something like that, and you're looking at the bigger picture for AI, I think their commentary reinforced what, what the standard belief is here at Deepwater, which is we're still in the early innings of the AI build cycle, and that's going to continue for several years. Makes a ton of sense, and specifically, there's a lot of questions regarding the the high bandwidth memory piece of the business. It's it's only two percent of their revenue. It didn't exist a few quarters ago. They didn't give exact guidance of what to expect it to account for in uh, fiscal 25, but you could kind of back into uh, their market share expectations and get to kind of uh, 10 to 15 percent of revenue. So going from two percent to 10 to 15 percent of revenue. And uh, this piece around the high bandwidth, I, th I think there's just a, a fun dynamic around it because it typically takes three and next year four of these DRAM wafers to make an HBM. They are essentially pulling some of their inventory away from their kind of core product. And what that will have the effect of is restricting supply in the marketplace because only two other Samsung and SK Hynix that make these, uh, makes basically make DRAM. And will have the effect of raising the margins of the overall business. And so, uh, this is uh, definitely a boom part of the the cycle here. Things are looking really good, and I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on the AI piece. But as you kind of think maybe beyond uh, looking into these uh, increased capex that they had, and they're going to be bringing more capacity on in twenty seven and twenty eight and twenty nine. Uh, isn't this a uh, function of time before Micron blows up? Blows up is probably a strong word. I would I would word it differently and say uh, there is a cyclical reality to the chip space there has been for decades, um, where you get these inventory builds, you get these inventory draws, you have concurrent pricing dynamics that then just change the revenue and margin dynamics of these businesses. And so right now, obviously we're in an inventory drawdown, we're in a more supply constrained environment that is good for revenue and margins for Micron and others in the space. I think the question is, how long are we going to live in this environment? It could be one more year, it could be 10 years. Mm -hmm. And oh. as an AI investor, I think that's true for most of these hardware names. You, you're really making an assessment of how long do you think this build cycle will last? And, and really what that question boils down to is how long do you think we're going to have these linear scaling laws for machine intelligence? So long as we keep getting better intelligence with more data and more compute, we're going to have to keep building more of this hardware. If something changes with the way these models are structured and the way we create artificial intelligence, that could be, you know, kind of a step function change moment where the demand picture changes, probably not overnight. I think that would be exaggerated, but in a short order where this could get re-rated. And that, but that's of the course, thing that's that what you really changing, have to figure out here. Yeah, that changing piece that you're referring to is effectively the models become more efficient and are able to get smarter on less. You don't need to kind of continue to increase the compute capacity to improve the intelligence of the model. There's some sort of a, a shift 
uh, like you said, a paradigm shift around how the models are being built. And, and what, what's the reality of, of that happening? Are we seeing any indications? I know Microsoft recently talked about uh, them wanting to pursue this. And is this something that is kind of brewing in the back halls of, these, uh, a, of the tech giants to try to improve the efficiency of these models? Everyone is certainly experimenting with alternative ways to build these models. I don't think we've seen anything or heard anything, certainly not in published research yet, that would lead us to believe that there is that change on the horizon. But I think it's something that will be, it'll be a perpetual exper yeah. uh, experiment because well, either one, one of two things is going to happen. We're either going to hit AGI and then potentially super intelligence on the current path, this linear scaling path. And then if there is a better way to do it, then theoretically, the AGI, the superintelligence should be able to figure that out and do it for us. Or we're going to figure out this other method and we're going to change there, right? So like, if it exists, we will find it and bump into it at some point, just naturally. Is there like a, what would be the analogy of something that's happened in the past that would suggest that they will find more efficient models or won't? I, you probably, if you give it the broadest interpretation, you would generally probably say something to the effect of everything in technology over time gets better and more efficient. Um, mm -hmm. You know, gas cars today are more efficient than gas cars 100 years ago. EVs today, you know, are going to be less efficient than EVs 10 years from now. Um, mm -hmm. So historically in technology, those things do get more efficient. But, but the, I would the capacity argue it doesn't, and the demand increases yeah, but, too over time. But it doesn't, well, yes, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the model itself has to get better, right? It could be that the underlying hardware that supports the models gets better. They could become more power efficient. I mean, that's the other bet. That's the inverted bet here. Either you're betting that the models get more efficient and we need less of our current type of hardware to support intelligence in the future, or you could bet the models don't get more efficient but the chips do, mm -hmm. right? You get, you get a chip that can process the uh, type of intelligence using transformers you know, that we're doing right now uh, in a better way. So that's, that could be where you get the efficiency from. I, I'll tell you this, like I guarantee you we will find efficiency in the current paradigm that we're pushing here, whether it is that we go to a different model architecture or that it is through efficiency in the hardware. Makes a ton of sense. Let's jump to the second topic. Amazon is rumored to be coming out with a, basically a Timu competitor. And uh, there uh, have been kind of in the back of investors' minds has been this kind of competitive risk. Amazon stock's done really well this year. I think it's up like 30 plus percent. But this uh, Timu piece now, it sounds like that they're going to address it. And um, I think it's it's kind of was inevitable that they're going to get into this. It, it's not a surprise. And um, my question is, do they need to brand this as something different or is, are they, do they need to kind of uh, feather this in? Kind of like Amazon Fresh is just kind of part of sometimes when you do a search on Amazon, then some of the items are fresh, some of them aren't. Do you think it's going to be like that or it's just going to be kind of a separate experience? Um, I think they should probably feather in more than create a separate experience. I, I don't think that um, separating doing this low cost piece from the Amazon brand would make a ton of sense because, I mean, there's already a lot of low price junk from China on Amazon. So it's not like they're introducing some new category of product. You know, it just feels like they're maybe finding ways to make things even cheaper or introduce even lower cost items on Amazon. So to me, feathering it in makes more sense. And then you have it built Did right into a shopping experience that people already love. But do you know, like, there's a quality difference there too. Like, Timu is almost like disposable commerce. And yeah, I, I think there's a lot of I things think, you can buy on Amazon now that are disposable though, for that's sure. That's true, but I think Timu is like a, a level, more, but... almost a level further in that. Or... Yeah, no, I think it probably is. But, but I think um, if it's disposable at this level and then it's disposable and it costs a dollar or two less, I don't know that you're going to have some negative opinion of the Amazon brand if you know that you're getting the right. lowest cost possible thing. Well, it'd show up in the ratings eventually. That I think that's yeah, that's and then a good things would probably that. score lower based on that. And I, I wonder just what does this mean for margins if this ends up at ultimately becoming a bigger part of their business is at lower margin. They wouldn't be the the supply. Are they the first? Would they be the first person in this, or are these like basically allow for a third party type of Timu experience? Didn't seem clear. Maybe a mix. 
but it sounded like they're working with suppliers that are in China that are going to deliver these and, and whether that means they advertise right and, and function as third parties or do it through Amazon or FBA. Yeah, it might be a mix. And the, the margins, like, is this something that we should, is now this going to become the question? Because Timu can't be making any money. Certainly not when you factor in all that they're spending on advertising. So I think from from a, a customer-based standpoint, that's one benefit that Amazon probably has, is they don't need to go out and build a brand of something that people have never heard of before. Right. Um, so I think that's the biggest structural issue for Timu margins. Knowing Amazon, the way they run their infrastructure, the way they run their company, you know, they can probably get away with it being at least break even, if not modestly profitable, would be my guess over the long run. Awesome. We're going to shift to the third topic, which is we're wrapping the first half of the year at the time of this recording. A lot of headlines related to just kind of the strength of AI and NASDAQ being up 20% for year to date and uh, just what a great year this has been for tech. And of course, when you go below the hood, it tells a little bit of a different story. We looked at kind of the top five AI hardware companies uh, year to date, up uh, 75%. The top five software companies year to date, down 3%. I mean, these are big companies. And it is, I mean, that couldn't be more of the tale of two topics, uh, up 75, down three. And uh, is software going to get the AI bid? At some point, yes, but I think right now the sentiment is software is dead and that there's a, a question of, is this broad category of software, are they going to be beneficiaries of AI or are they going to be victims of AI? And I think that it depends company to company. We haven't really figured that out in many cases because most of these companies are the ones that are building some of this software internally. They're building some of this infrastructure uh, internally and they're just starting to get products into customers' hands. And it's unclear if they can make more money, you know, from these products that have been enhanced by AI. So I think it's going to take time still for us to see that. I don't think this is the year, and we've been saying this all year, I think, as well. This is not the year that you're going to see the inflection in software revenues from AI like we saw from NVIDIA in hardware. I think that we're at least a year from that, if not maybe two. And I did hear a recap of something. I think it was Sachin Nadella was speaking at the CO2 conference a week or two ago. And he's, he was kind of framing it as there's sort of this mismatch in duration between these companies, including Microsoft, needing to invest a ton of money in infrastructure right now and the ultimate payback period. I think there's this assumption or maybe hope from investors where it's like, okay, we're investing this year and then we're going to get payback immediately. And I think what Nadella was trying to say was we're investing this year, but it's going to take us years potentially mm -hmm. before we really get payback from this investment. So you, you have to believe that AI is this paradigm shift that many of us think it is. And then you're going to see the benefits of it over time, not that you all of a sudden get this inflection you know, next year and everybody's in video. Yeah, I wonder, should we be positioning our portfolio more towards <clears throat> software right now? We've had uh, great hardware exposure, but should we be positioning that more towards software? I mean, ahead of the curve, you want to be a year early. If things start really, revenue starts going in 2027, probably now is the time to start to build positions. And I think we've done that, or we, we try to do that creatively at Deepwater where our benefit is we get to invest in the public and private markets. Mm -hmm. And when we think about the beneficiaries of AI, where it's really not priced in, you know, I think, and, and beyond just looking at the mega caps and, and their brethren, I think the playbook for us has been invest in hardware in the public markets, largely. That's where most of these big companies exist. And those are the ones that are creating these products. Micron, we talked about earlier. And in the software side, really looking at it from a private markets perspective, XAI is a recent investment that we made at Deepwater that we're really excited about. Obviously, one of the four potential uh, foundation models in our view. Mm -hmm. But even beyond that, I think there's other great companies out there in the private markets that have pure play AI exposure that you can't find in the public markets. And mm -hmm. that's what we're really trying to build the portfolio around. I love it. On the private side, look for those companies to be going public two, three years down the road. Uh, it won't be that long before we're back. That'll be next week. On behalf of DTEP 315, bye for now.